Welcome to the Stark Reflections on Writing and Publishing podcast. There has never been a better time for writers. More information, options, and opportunities are available to you. But navigating these requires insight. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre as he draws upon more than a quarter century of experience as a writer, a bookseller, and a trusted book industry consultant to explore and reflect on the writing and publishing landscape to help you make informed choices on your writer journey. Hello and welcome to episode 39 of the Stark Reflections podcast. This is your host, Mark Leslie Lefebvre, and I'll be flying solo in this episode, which features something I'm pretty excited about. It's an abridged, not yet complete audio version, or audio draft, I should say, from a chapter from a forthcoming book that I'm releasing, which will be entitled, drumroll please, The Seven P's of Publishing Success. That chapter is on professionalism, which is the third P on the list, but I'll get back to that shortly and in the reflections at the end of this episode. In terms of personal updates, here are a few things in this writer's life that are going on. On Monday, September 24th, I'll be heading to St. Pete, Florida. Yes, the home of last week's guest, Nathan Van Koops, but it's also the annual home of Nink, or Novelists Inc. Writing Conference. I'm attending as an industry representative, and I'm, I'm pretty thrilled to be there for the first time as a complete indie representative. In my previous visits there, I was there as the Kobo rep. This time it's just me, my Stark Publishing and Stark Reflections brand, a little bit of my author brand. I'm going to be there as a full and complete indie, not just an in- indie lover, as I was when I was a corporate dude. Uh, it's one of several trips I'm making this fall to invest in my own personal brand, in the consulting and the coaching that I do, and in the new books that I'm releasing under the Stark Publishing Solutions imprint. Yes, teased about that already. More about that later, again, in the Reflections segment. But while at NINC, I'm going to be offering two sessions. The first, at 9 a.m. on Thursday morning, I'll be doing five career-killing errors an author should avoid. And here's the summary for that. Authors have never had more opportunity than ever in the history of publishing. More tools, more options are in front of them than ever before, but with greater possibilities for pathways to success come greater risks and more potholes. Join Mark Leslie Lefebvre, who leverages three decades of experience as a writer, bookseller, and trusted industry representative. Where have you heard that before? To spotlight the five largest errors, along with opportunities to help authors navigate around them and other potential disasters to chart their own unique pathways to success. And on Friday at 4.30 p.m., Matt Buckman, also known as the author M.L. Buckman, and I will be hosting slash leading an open discussion called Brainstorming the Future for Authors and Vendors. And here's the description. It's time to have a voice in the publishing industry's future, the immediate future, and in the next couple of years. We all know about Facebook and BookBub ads, and we understand, or like to think we understand, author branding, series thinking, and the wide host of other current marketing tools. Production is rolling. But in this session, we want to ask, what's next? Come join the fun as we tackle the questions of what authors wish vendors would provide next, and what the vendors wish they understood about what in the world authors are thinking about the future should be a fantastic open discussion. Also, while I'm at NINC, and this will be happening prior to the conference starting, I'll be participating in what I'm calling the St. Pete Books in Beer Tour. See, Nathan, I got it right and said St. Pete, not St. Pete's. I was listening to you when you told me that. I'll be leading a small group of authors to Haslam's Bookstore, which is a fine bookstore with an awesome history and a link to the American Bookseller Association sort of royal family heritage. But it's also allegedly haunted by Jack Kerouac, which I wrote about in my book Tomes of Terror, Haunted Bookstores and Libraries. After uh, the brief visit to Haslam's, which is, you know, fun for us writers and book nerds, we'll be visiting several of the local breweries particularly for my love of craft beer and exploring, but also for my Spirits Untapped branding and the forthcoming book, the same name, via spiritsuntapped.com. 
Yes, you can see I'm trying to make the cost of this trip, the flight, the hotel, the conference registration, all of that stuff, a proper and full tax write-off for my writing and consulting business. While at NINC as well, during the conference, I'll be conducting some short on-the-spot interviews with some of the folks that I meet and hang out with there, most likely via Facebook Live Bits, which you can catch on my Stark Publishing Solutions Facebook page. And any of the ones with decent audio are likely to appear in a forthcoming episode of this podcast. And if I have any extra material that's either too long or doesn't fit into a standard episode, I might just end up putting that into the special extra content episodes that I have started to roll out via Patreon. With a quick nod and thanks to all my patrons over at patreon.com slash darkreflections. And yes, you too, for as little as a coffee or two a month, can get access to the additional resources, audio, video, information, and insights, including I will be sharing a post ink look at the presentation I did and some of the things that I learned there. Now, also, while at Nink, Joanna Penn from the Creative Pen Podcast promised me that we might get the chance to team up to do our special duet of Bon Jovi's Living on a Prayer. And you haven't heard Bon Jovi's Living on a Prayer until you've heard Joe and I do our special duet version of it. Uh, We last did this in North Carolina four years ago. It was so much fun. I look forward to a reprise from that. (laughs) Speaking of reprises, I'm really hoping that Dan Wood from Draft to Digital Eye get a chance to, uh, you know, do another version of If I Had a Million Dollars by Bare Naked Ladies, which is a lot of fun to do with Dan. Um, I'll also want to try and do some of my favorites, the Elvis tune, Are You Lonesome Tonight, or the Weird Al tune, uh, the classic One More Minute, you know, both beautiful ballads. Uh, Weird Al's a little bit more dark humor, of course, uh, and, and I really want to give one of these a try. I've never done karaoke for these, but I'd love to do Sex and Candy by Marcy Playground, or I'm Gonna Miss Her by Brad Paisley. Both really fun songs, and they don't require high notes, which I'm not all that good at hitting. In other personal news, a quick shout out to Rook Winters, who tweeted a couple of pictures of some awesome skull plates that he spotted at a winter's store with this text. Stumbled upon these plates while listening to Mark Leslie, Stark Reflections podcast. What could be more on brand in that moment than Barnaby Bones plates covered in writing? (laughs) And those are great pictures. Um, Thank you, Rook. You inspired me to want to head over to the local winter store to see if I could get some. It's always great to hear from listeners and see what they're doing while listening to the show or to hear about what guests um, or topics from the show have inspired them. And you can tweet me at Mark Leslie. And yes, I'm kind of riffing on that from Joanna Penn's The Creative Pen Podcast because I quite enjoy listening to that segment of the show. And so if you do hit me here, I'll uh, I'll do uh, a return of that and, and share some of the tweets and other comments that come in. Speaking of comments, thanks also to the new folks who filled out the survey for this podcast. I've received notification that a few more have come in, and I need to get to reading them. I appreciate the feedback, and I've already incorporated some of the feedback from previous surveys into updating and tweeting this podcast to make it more useful to you. Has anyone noticed that I don't do the tongue twisters any longer? I received a number of comments, actually, and survey feedback bits that told me you understood why it was there, but that you skipped ahead of it because it wasn't really doing anything for you. So I revised that segment of the show. Even though, I'll be honest, uh, I don't mind embarrassing myself, as I'm sure you know, but if you like to hear me embarrass myself, there's all those many backlist episodes of me tripping on my tongue, not to mention the horrible singing I do for some of those segments. But speaking of sponsors, this episode is sponsored by Findaway Voices, and rather than tell you about why I think they're awesome for indie authors to control their writing and publishing journey, I'm going to share the fact that I'm currently producing a self-narrated audiobook version of the seven P's of publishing success, and I'll be using Findaway Voices for uploading and distribution. I normally prefer to use the professional narrators that Findaway offers, but as a listener, I really enjoy hearing a nonfiction book when narrated by the author, so that's what I'm going to do here. I'm eager to see how this process will work out, and I'll be sure to share the details with you in the weeks to come, including where I screw up and where things go well. And that, because yes, I'm a self-proclaimed master of segues, leads nicely into the main segment of this show. What you are about to hear is an abridged draft audio version of the chapter 
on professionalism that will be in my book, The Seven P's of Publishing Success. Now, I'm sharing it here so that you listeners of the Stark Reflections podcast can be the first people, other than my editor and first readers, to get access to it. And the very first people to hear a rough draft of me reading that chapter as I'm testing different things, different setups out. I tried my best to keep the same style in this book that I use for the reflection segment of this podcast, personable and in a conversational tone. I think that comes through quite nicely in the audio, but my editor and I continue to debate on how that translates to text. We'll see. In any case, here's that early audio draft of the chapter on professionalism. Professionalism. One interesting thing about writing is that there are so many different courses and workshops that teach a writer the craft of writing, but there's not nearly as many resources out there to assist a writer with the behavior that is associated with being a professional. And, just for the sake of clarity, I'm not talking about a pro as being someone who receives money for the work they produce. I'm talking about the way a writer behaves and interacts within the writing and publishing communities and with fans. I'm talking about reading and understanding different publishing-related contracts. I'm talking about meeting deadlines and commitments. I'm talking about operating within the conventions of an expected format or genre. I'm talking about dealing with reviews, critics, and adversity, and maintaining an overall positive reputation. The digital world created opportunities well beyond the restrictions that previously existed for writers, but it also inadvertently exposed a far wider realm of levels of professionalism, or perhaps levels of lack of professionalism, than ever before. Perhaps in the old-school gatekeeper process of finding an agent and a publisher and of getting work published, the large steps The restrictive processes and the longer waiting periods allowed a writer the opportunity to acclimatize themselves to moving from hobbyist writer to professional. That isn't to say that the publishers offered the writers any training in this regard, nor that all the people who have been or are traditionally published behave like professional writers, but perhaps the required actions such as the query letter, the manuscript submission process, or even the pitching process had the side effect of forcing some writers into beginning to develop those skills well before their work was actually published. Of course, one side effect of this new world which allows virtually anybody the ability to create an account and click a few buttons and get their ebooks into the world's largest bookstore in a matter of hours means that there are many writers out there who aren't actual writers like you and me. They're simply using the same tools, believing that they'll be able to make a quick buck. In the strictly traditional gatekeeper process of publishing, most of these people wouldn't have bothered because of the intense work and waiting involved in that old process. They give all of us writers a bad name because their behavior is typically far removed from any desire to ever be a professional writer. But let's just ignore those people for now, except to say that Because you've taken time to listen to a book like this, you already stand out as someone willing to invest not only in your writing, but in yourself as a professional. Of course, just in case you are thinking that I'm poo-pooing digital publishing in favor of the glory days of traditional publishing, let me share the flip side. Because there is another trend that has taken place in traditional publishing that didn't exist before. There was a time long ago where a writer could simply live like a hermit, pound out words on their typewriters, hand that manuscript to their editor or agent, and sit back, letting the system take care of the distribution and sales of their work. They never had to appear in public, nor did they even have to behave in a professional manner. The same gatekeepers that held back the floodgates of submitted manuscripts also protected some of those published writers from ever being revealed as awkward introverts who weren't skilled at interacting well with others, or perhaps the ones who were just plain jerks. Of course, those days are gone. Even if you traditionally publish, your job isn't done once you hand that manuscript over. One of the criteria publishers pay attention to for the writers they contract is their presence, their engagement in social media. 
and their professionalism. For the most part, regardless of whether you are traditionally published or are self-published, understanding and behaving professionally can be something that prevents you from being successful or standing out as a consummate pro. Paperwork, Contracts, and Content Within traditional publishing, there are templates, formats, and behaviors associated with the query and submission process. There are boilerplate contracts, and there are publishers who only publish particular types of books or particular genres. Taking the time to learn and understand all of these nuances demonstrates your professionalism and will save you a significant amount of time and, most likely, frustration and heartache. Getting a contract from a publisher can be an exciting thing. But understanding that the contract is a negotiation and thus something that is negotiable is an important element of protecting your long-term intellectual property, or IP. Publishers will, of course, set out a contract that gives them everything they could ever possibly want, even if they don't plan on exploiting all those rights. It's okay to have a respectful discussion about some of the clauses that might be detrimental to you and your work. A book that I strongly recommend writers read is Deal Breakers by Christine Catherine Rush. I didn't discover the book, unfortunately, until I had already signed my first contract with Dundurn for one of my nonfiction ghost story titles. Having worked in the industry for years and understanding a bit about what I was doing, I'd already made a few requests to their standard boilerplate contract that I was unwilling to sign. But when it came time to sign the contract for the next book, Having just finished reading Rush's Deal Breakers, I found 12 more clauses that I asked them to change. Dundurn responded by either removing or revising 10 of the 12 clauses that I had an issue with. The two remaining ones I had asked to change were long shots on my part, and they weren't make or break for me, so I was quite satisfied with the result. And now they have a unique contract template for me and my books going forward, all thanks to the advice from Christine Catherine Rush. If you don't ask, you definitely don't receive. And there's no harm in asking, unless of course you ask in an unprofessional manner. When I wrote back to Dundurn, I was courteous and I was respectful. I didn't write a letter decrying that they were blood-sucking scavengers and that I refused to sign until they removed those particular clauses that were an insult to me and my integrity. I outlined my hesitation at signing them and where applicable, I explain my reasoning for each request. And, even though the contracts with the various retailers like Kindle Direct Publishing or Kobo Writing Life or the digital distributors such as Smashwords or draft to digital are not negotiable, it's just as important that you read through and understand the terms you are agreeing to and perhaps even the rights you might be giving up. For example, there is a common clause in all of the major e-retailer terms that you agree to when signing up. Sometimes internally referred to as the Most Favored Nation Clause, it states that you cannot sell the same ebook via another retail outlet for a lower price. If so, that retailer reserves the right to price match and take that lost revenue out of your share. Amazon is perhaps the only retailer that regularly and aggressively responds to violations of this term. But you should go back and double-check the terms you signed up for at KDP, at Kobo, and at the other retailers and distributors you're using, and you'll see that they all have some language to that effect. Now, beyond contracts and agreements that you sign with others are the things that you do within your own office that are important, such as tracking expenses, submissions, publications, etc. For example, in traditional publishing, keeping a log or spreadsheet of what story or novel was submitted to which magazine, agent, or publisher allows you to properly track where each of your stories or books currently are in their life cycle. Filing the contracts and keeping track of when the rights you license to a publisher can help you when it comes time to leveraging those rights when another opportunity presents itself. Or, Perhaps understanding that you only sold North American rights to a publisher means that you still own the rest of world rights and can use Kindle Direct Publishing or Kobo Writing Life, for example, to publish the work to other territories. This practice is becoming more and more common for many writers who previously were only exploiting their IP using traditional publishing. 
Within self-publishing, tracking which titles are published to which retailers and through which processes, as well as the pricing that you've set in multiple currencies to ensure that they are consistent across the various global retail channels, as per the clause I just mentioned a few minutes earlier. It might seem simple, but as your catalog grows and your use of multiple sources for the broadest global distributor increases or even changes over time, it might be difficult to know how one particular book is being published to one particular online store. So this tracking helps keep those in line and helps you understand where everything is and at what price. Now, speaking of multiple currencies, attending to and paying attention to currencies well beyond the standard U.S. dollar ensures that your ebook itself reflects a price that looks natural to a consumer in that territory. It not only looks more professional, but doing this strategically can help increase your bottom line earnings. For traditional publishing, there's a specific example format and process for how to send your work to be considered for publication. There are expected protocols within each step of the process. Understanding those is key to success within that method of publishing. And when it comes to self-publishing, there are similar expectations that demonstrate professionalism. The expectation is that the work being published has been professionally edited, that it has been proofread, and that the marketing copy and cover design has been created with the target audience or ideal reader in mind. These are processes that a traditional publisher is usually skilled at, although I regularly do have a say for those elements for my own traditionally published books. The difference is that I'm not responsible for finding the skilled person to create and work on them as I am when it's a self-published project. One final thought on the idea of contracts is being reliable in honoring your commitment. Does your contract state or did you commit to handing your manuscript over to your editor by a particular date? Do so! Did you hire an editor for your self-published work under a specific schedule of when they could expect to receive that work? Hit that deadline. Give these people a reason to want to work with you again. Otherwise, you'll be losing contracts or not being able to rehire a great professional who helps make your work better. And you'll gain a reputation as being unreliable otherwise. Did you put up a pre-order for a specific date on a self-published work? Then do everything in your power to upload the final version of that book on time as per the retailer's protocol. Sure, Kindle Direct Publishing will revoke your pre-order privileges for a year, but there are other consequences far deeper that affect your image. Think about the fans who've trusted in you and pre-ordered that book, and what this missed deadline means to the people who've invested in you and in your book. In-person appearances and people skills. I'm going to start with a few basics that you might snicker about because they seem to be givens, but it's not something to laugh about. It happens more often than you might suspect. Your personal appearance should adhere to some basic social standards and conventions, such as the basics of personal hygiene and grooming. Yes, Many writers are introverts and are perhaps most comfortable sitting in seclusion in pajamas or underwear that they haven't changed for days, or they relish in being eclectic and reclusive and unique in their appearance. Eclectic and specific author branding is fine. I mean, as part of my horror and ghost story writer brand, I make appearances with a life-size skeleton named Barnaby and typically wear dark clothes that feature skulls. But there's being eclectic and making a decided effort to appear with a specifically curated brand. And there's basic hygiene. It should have to go without being said. Sadly, I've seen it all too often, and I feel it's worth stating. Bathe or shower. Tidy your hair. Brush your teeth. Wear clean clothes. This works well whether you are meeting with agents, editors, retail representatives, other writers, or fans. And while your outward appearance and the smell you project can have a detrimental impact upon your professionalism, so too can the manner by which you conduct yourself either in public or online. Simply, don't be a jerk. 
treat other people with respect, and whether it's through in-person discussions, email communications, or even comments left on various social media channels, conduct yourself with professionalism and grace. There are far too many stories of authors behaving badly. You don't want to be considered one of them. Think about someone that you met who was crass, rude, vulgar, and unpleasant. Someone who had nothing but negative things to say or hostile reactions to virtually any stimulus. Is that a person you enjoy interacting with? Is that someone you would want to invest time, energy, or, as a reader perhaps, invest your hard-earned money in? Don't be that person. It's not just useful in your role as a writer, but it's also something of value for life in general. You never know when the person in front of you in line at the grocery store, for example, could be a reader or a potential reader. Or the random person sitting on the bus or plane beside you might be another writer or work for a publisher or retailer you're interested in fostering a relationship with. People are more likely to share their negative impression of someone than to pass along praise. So it is easy to make a bad impression and far more difficult to make a positive one. As a bookseller and retailer representative, I can tell you that I've gone out of my way to promote, push, and share titles from authors whose behavior, either towards me or my witnessing of the way they treated others, was professional, courteous, and respectful. And, on the flip side, I have purposely ignored, deleted messages from, and even actively shared warnings to colleagues about those I have dealt with who are difficult, disrespectful, and unprofessional in their approach. Which one of those would you rather be seen as by a bookseller? No matter how people interact with you, or who they are, their impression of you should reflect professionalism. You never know who is watching. Or, more aptly, assume that everyone is watching all the time and behave accordingly. Handling Rejection Rejection comes in many ways to writers. In traditional publishing, it usually comes in the response to a submission. But in self-publishing, and even in traditional publishing, rejection can come in the form of negative reviews. One thing to consider, and something I learned from fellow author Carrie Flanagan, was that the work was not rejected. It was most likely something that was not right for that editor at that time or, in the case of a negative review, that the reader wasn't the ideal target audience for that writing. Carrie doesn't even like to use the word rejection. She feels it's too harsh and carries far too many negative connotations. But regardless, the truth is that you are not being personally rejected. Your writing is. That specific book, story, or article is being rejected, and it's usually because there's a mismatch between the reader and the writer. Common advice for authors is to never read the reviews of their books on sites like Goodreads or Amazon. It is good advice. And responding to reviews in any way, even in what you believe is a positive way, can easily be misinterpreted as you being a defensive author with thin skin. But sometimes, if a writer learns how to accept or handle rejection or negative reviews, then they can use that to further develop either their writing or their business practices. I'll share two examples from my own experience, one from traditional publishing and another from self-publishing. Early in my writing submission days, my desire was to have one of my horror stories appear in the respected and award-winning Northern Frights anthology series edited by Don Hutchison. Year after year, I would submit stories to Don, and year after year, he would reject the stories, often writing a line or two about what it was about the story that didn't work for him. Now, Don is a brilliant editor. He could quite effectively in just one or two sentences point out something that a good developmental editor often helps a writer turn a good story into an excellent one. So I often reflected upon Don's comments and I applied them in a revision to the story. And often I ended up selling that story to another editor after following Don's advice. Years later, and the first time I met Don at a book launch event in Toronto in person, he recognized my name, and the first thing he said to me was, Ah, yes, Mark Leslie, I remember your stories. I'm, I'm sorry we never connected on any of them. Please don't be sorry, I replied. In fact, Don, I wanted to thank you. 
because the comments you wrote back to me helped me revise and sell those stories to other markets. Your rejections have actually helped my career as a writer. I'm pretty sure that Don's impression of me improved upon that encounter. It's not often that an editor will ever hear a writer share something positive that came from having their work rejected. Many years ago, I created a digital chapbook of a couple of previously published short stories about snowmen that were often well-received and adored by readers. I packaged them under the title Snowman Shivers, colon, Scary Snowman Tales, and made it a perma-free title in order to attract new readers to my work. Over the years, it received plenty of both positive and negative reviews, and while I typically take negative reviews with a grain of salt, I did notice something in one of them. It said that the stories were well written, but the stories were more dark humor than scary. I realized that I had unintentionally misled readers or created the wrong impression. That reviewer was right. The tales were more Twilight Zone-ish than horror, and while they were indeed airy, there was a strong undertone of dark humor to them. So, in mid-2018, I revised the ebook and I updated the subtitle. My goal was to ensure that I didn't mislead or misrepresent the title and have the wrong reader picking it up, expecting one thing, but then getting another. And, ever since making that update, the downloads of this title have increased, and the accompanying reviews are from people whose expectations were more likely in line with the actual product. Yes, reading negative reviews can be difficult, and responding to them in any way is something that is best avoided. But, being able to step back and look at the review with a critical eye about how to make either the product or the representation of that product better can be helpful. But only if you're able to step back and look at it, not as the creative writer with a heart of glass, but as the professional who is always striving to become better. So there you have that sample chapter from the seven P's, uh, chapter on professionalism. I know I teased a lot in the introduction of this episode about this book, or rather this unexpected book, and that's kind of the reflection here. See, I've been working quietly, or not so quietly sometimes in the background, uh, since I left Kobo in November 2017 to write a, a book about my 25 years of experience in the book industry. I know I've briefly mentioned it you know, a number of times, probably, particularly um, uh, when I did a big double down on uh, working on it uh, for several days, uh, just concentrated in August to get some stuff done. But I wanted to kind of share how that book is now three books and the now revised plan of rolling those books out. What you heard was uh, an abridged version, or an abridged earlier draft version of the chapter on professionalism. I've already revised it with some recent notes and updates uh, from my editor. Yes, it continues to be a moving target, even this close to publication. Um, now that audio is a test reading of it in prep for the um, audiobook, uh, as well as a partial early and uh, pre-send um, edit to, uh, before sending it uh, to my editor. Um, and I find that actually I, I've learned as I was doing that that didn't matter how many times I had proofread or even claimed to have read it out loud, actually reading out loud and recording it helped me find even more errors in the manuscript. So that was a really, really cool exercise. But the, the book itself, um, it's drawn from what was meant to be a chapter in that larger book. So, so let's go back to that larger book for a second. So I started off with these plans back in November 2017 to, to write a book with the main title, um, Indie Publishing Insider Secrets, with a subtitle, Insight, Perspective, and Wisdom on Writing, Publishing, and Book Selling from a 25-year book industry professional. You see, as I was writing uh, the first draft of the book, the, the chapter on the, on the P's for uh, publishing success kept growing and growing. And then when I hit 10,000 words for that chapter, even before turning the book over to my editor, I realized that I was going to have to cut that chapter down to a simpler, more summarized overview of the seven P's of publishing success. So, so I did that. But in the process of cutting and refining the content down, I kept seeing these elements that I had to cut and leave on the, you know, on the cutting room floor. 
uh, from the unabridged version, and I, and I felt they were still useful. It could be useful because I like to see different examples when I'm learning something. So uh, I showed that original first draft version to my editor, and they asked why I didn't consider revising and instead of cutting, further fleshing out that chapter and make it into a mini standalone ebook with each of the P's becoming their own chapter. See, that, of course, is the brilliance of working with a professional editor or, or having that second or third pair of eyes to bounce your writing off of. It's perspective. So the seven P's of publishing success uh, is, is sitting around about uh, 16,000 words. It's a, it's a smaller book, but enough decent content that people can find some value from it. And similarly, I had a chapter outlining all the things I knew about Kobo, you know, six years there. Uh, and, and while writing this main book, I, I also had been drafting up a free 10-day series of emails uh, for Readsy about Kobo Insights, and that was uh, based on content for that chapter. But as I was writing and working on this chapter, both for the emails as well as for the chapter, I realized I, I was cutting stuff out, and that chapter alone was already 20,000 words, and I wasn't even done. So for the full book, uh, I cut the chapter down uh, to just the basics, but I left all that additional information, info, insights, and reflections, I left it in the standalone book, again, for those who want more detail. So now I have the following three books in the Stark Publishing Solutions imprint lineup. I have the seven P's of publishing success, killing it on Kobo, and Indie Publishing Insider Secrets. Now, now looking back, my editor and I feel like the three books really serve the purposes nicely and create an interesting progression from shorter to longer, but also a progression that the longer book's going to have lots of um, lots of details in it. Uh, those other two go into extreme detail in those two particular topics. You know, one generically about publishing success, whether you're self-publishing or indie publishing, uh, killing it on Kobo, mostly for independent um, publishing, but also for hybrid publishing. And then, of course, indie publishing insider secrets, which again, yes, it's about indie publishing, but it's also about uh, authorship, etc., etc. Now, and if all goes well, the seven P's of publishing success will be live by the end of September 2008. Killing It on Kobo will be live by the middle of October. And the Indie Publishing Insider Secrets will be live by the end of November. I'm starting to work at getting those pre-orders up now. Nothing like putting the pressure on at the last minute, isn't there? If you're interested, there'll be links in the show notes. Um, I'll probably use something like marklesley.ca slash stark publishing solutions where you can learn more about these books and that imprint to thank you as listeners i'll probably be using some excerpts from the book uh, in future episodes to give you that extra content you you may have even heard some of that from the chapter on professionalism in some of my reflections so you're already getting a lot of that content on the fly um, but i uh, believe i'm going to be making the audio version of the seven p's available free for my patreon supporters it's the least i can do to say thanks for all your support, and since you probably enjoy listening to audio, you wouldn't mind that version, which will probably be way more expensive uh, than the uh, the ebook version, which will most likely be launched at 99 cents before it goes up to its full price. Again, I'll keep sharing information about that as it happens, because you know I'm a bit of a seat of the pants kind of guy. In any case, that draws episode 39 of the Stark Reflections podcast to a close. Thanks for hanging out with me. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode with that chapter on professionalism. And I will be coming back to you next week from Nink, St. Pete, Florida. Hopefully with some clips and interviews and all kinds of fun tidbits on what I'm learning at Novelists, Inc. Thanks for hanging out with me this week, and I will catch you next week. Here's wishing you great writing and good Stark Reflections. Thank you for listening to the Stark Reflections podcast. You can find show notes for each episode at starkreflections.ca. The music for this podcast, Laser Groove, was composed and produced by Kevin McLeod. Check out more of Kevin's great music at incomptech.com.